Mary McLeod Bethune was, at that time was Mary McLeod. She was born in Maysville, South Carolina. She was the daughter, the last daughter of 17 siblings. She was special and she was a outstanding young woman and had a lot of ability. So much so that she was trained at the Scotia Institute uh, in Barbara, Scotia, North Carolina. And she had so much prowess that she taught her brothers and sisters how to read because she realized just the power of being able to unlock the words of reading was just such a powerful thing. She went on from there to Chicago and came under the tutelage of the great evangelist Dwight L. Moody and she was trained as an evangelist. Uh, and what, one of the most outstanding stories of her life was the fact that she wanted to go to Africa to be a missionary. That was her magnificent obsession. But because she was a woman, because she was a black woman, she was not allowed to achieve her goal. She was about 25 years old around the 1900 at the turn of the century and it, because she was a woman and that was seen as a woman who was a pastor of a church and you can imagine a hundred years later what that's like and what it was like then a hundred years ago so as a result she came down from Chicago into a place called Augusta Georgia and she was trained further by a lady another black lady powerful black lady named Lucy Laney. And from there, she moved from Lucy Laney down into Palatka Hastings. Hastings Palatka was a migrant kind of camp. And right around that time, something was happening over in the part of Jacksonville. There was a man called Henry Flagler, the richest man in America at that time. He and his partner, John D. Rockefeller, had just made a fortune with the Standard Oil Company. And Henry Flagler had moved to Jacksonville and subsequently to St. Augustine. And his great idea was the building of a railroad that would stretch from Jacksonville all the way to Miami and further to Key West. And at that time, the way you made money and always make money even today, if you can cut down labor costs, you can make a fortune. Well, guess what? The greatest source of cheap labor at that time was the newly emancipated black man. And so what happened, they, uh, Henry Flagler found a lot of black men to help him build his railroad, which would be known as the Florida East Coast Railroad. Well, Mary McLeod was over in Hastings, Florida. And a Methodist minister from Jacksonville told her that the, the daughters associated with the railroad men, the black railroad men, were just running willy-nilly around. As a result, it might be an opportunity for her to start a school. So she would come over and find the opportunity to start a school. Another very significant thing was happening in black America as well. And that was, there was a debate going on between two black titans. One was named Booker T. Washington and the other was named W.E.B. Du Bois. This was happening right around the turn of the century. Both these men were trying to make their positions known about what would be the fate of the black man in America. W.E. Du Bois came from the philosophy of training the talented 10th. By that he meant that if you train 10%, the top 10%, then they would then in turn train the rest. Booker T took the opposite position where he was, was much more utilitarian and focused in terms of training the person with the work of the hand. Because America was, for all intents and purposes, a very agrarian society, very much agriculturally oriented. And so he came along with this idea of the head, the heart, the hand. 
Well, guess what? Booker T won the debate in the South. And what you have, if you ever take a good look at the logo of Bethune-Cookman College, Bethune-Cookman University, you will see the influence of Bethune by Booker T. Washington. You'll see the head, the heart, and the hand. If you're ever on the campus, take a good look when you come into the cafeteria. There's a large black and white photo of Mary McLeod Bethune in the very early, early days of the school. And it shows her with some young black girls and they, she was training them to be homemakers because that was the role of the black woman then. The 1920s were a most unusual time for the newly emancipated black man and woman. Specifically, as it relates to the 15th Amendment, which was ratified in 1870, five years before her birth, there was an action, a reaction, if you will, by the Ku Klux Klan to go against all of the things that had been established for the newly emancipated freedman. And in 1920, it came to a boil right here in Central Florida, where the Ku Klux Klan, hearing about the work that Mary McLeod Bethune was doing on our campus and encouraging people to take a sensitive right, came against her in terms of an election that took place in 1920 here in Daytona Beach. Just before an election in 1920, the terrifying rumor reached the campus that the Ku Klux Klan was going to march that same night. Night came and the entire city was pitch darkness. It was a warning to all the residents of Colortown not to appear at the polls on election day and the promise of what would happen if so much as one Negro tried to vote. Upon her return to Daytona, Mrs. Bethune listened unsmilingly to a report of the Klan episode. It was hardly news, and it certainly was no surprise. She had been educating the Negroes of Daytona for years and doing everything she could to straighten their backs and demand their undeniable rights. There were bound to be repercussions. She, for one, intended to vote in the election, and anyone who wished her to join was welcome to come. She turned on every light in the school, she boomed in her heavy, dramatic voice. Let them know we're home. The politically powerful KKK had turned off all the street lamps for its demonstration parade, designed to intimidate the entire Negro section and frighten its potential voters away from the poll. But it could not control the lights of the school. Mrs. Bethune ordered that all the lights within Faith Hall be turned off and all the outdoor ones on the campus be turned full on. At 8 o'clock the next morning when the polls opened, two lines were stretching outside the store, which was the assigned voting place, plainly marked white and colored. The registered Negroes reached far back along the block. Mrs. Bethune walked up and down the uneasy, fearful line, instilling confidence, and the line held. They were not giving in. They were kept standing there all day while the white men entered jovially and departed. Shortly before closing time, they were allowed in as the law decreed and cast their ballots. When the votes were counted, the clansmen had been defeated, and the man of their choice had been elected. In 1920, Election Day, November the 2nd, Mary McLeod Bethune stared down the evil of the KKK in Daytona Beach and won.
Mrs. Bethune would establish a national reputation with the NAACP in 1935 by being the first woman of color to receive the Spingarn Medal, the highest achievement by the NAACP in 1935. And in 1940, she would become vice president of the organization. In 1945, she and founder W.E.B. Du Bois would be an established envoy to San Francisco and the formation of the United Nations. Mary McLeod Bethune arguably would be one of the most influential women of color of the 20th century, being advisor to four U.S. presidents, Calvin Coolidge, Herbert Hoover, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, and Harry S. Truman.